What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the Hot Sauce. This is Angel Planel, a registered dietitian nutritionist in Seattle, Washington. I just cracked 100 subscribers, and the goal is to make it to 250. So do me a solid and like, comment, and subscribe, and let's get right into it. Today, we are going to feature Kristen Cooper, a registered dietitian nutritionist that resides in Norwalk, Connecticut. So welcome back to the hot sauce. Today we have Kristen Cooper. She's going to be on the hot seat today, but there's no hot seat here. <laughs> we like to have a good time. So let me change the screen. So she is in the hot seat here. And I guess, Kristen, let's go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about what you're doing now in your journey into the profession. Sure. I'm Kristen Cooper, and I founded Pace University's uh, Coordinated Program in Nutrition and Dietetics. We're an MS program. We are a two-year program that combines classroom learning with internship learning. So we, we have our rotation sort of embedded into our class schedule. And I'm joined by two fabulous dietitians, uh, Jessica Tosto, who is our director, uh, our chair, and our internship coordinator, and Mary Opfer, who is our chef nutritionist. All three of us went to teacher's college together. Uh, we were really bonded in our philosophy about teaching and our devotion to nutrition education. And uh, where we are now, we created a program that really emphasizes and we really welcome students of all backgrounds, um, students of, of uh, all races, all ethnicities, because we really feel it's important that we have people who reflect the diversity of our population uh, treating our patients. We also have a program that's unique in its culinary focus. We decided, based on what we learned at Teachers College, that showing people how to do things like like cooking, like food preparation, like reading labels and choosing foods was very important, more important even than the why to. And so we landed here at this program. We're growing um, and we also offer per interprofessional work so that our RDs, our RDs to be work alongside other professions in an interprofessional uh, simulation lab and outside the classroom to learn the various scopes of practice and the types of uh, information they can glean from their their fellow helping professions. Cool. That is awesome to hear. And yeah, why don't you give us a little background about how you got into the profession? I did go to school with you at Teachers College, so I'm always like, woo! <laughs> but yeah, just tell us tell us how you got in. It's been great keeping in touch, Angel. I'm very yes, very yes. thrilled to see all the things you've done. Um, I got into nutrition in a very circuitous way. I went to undergrad for political science and history, and I went to Brazil as an exchange student when I was in high school. And I went back to do research later on, on the political situation around women's health. And then I went back as a management consultant later on. And in that 20 year span, I saw such differences occurring when North American products and food were becoming the norm in Brazil. Um, the average Brazilian family would make a, a meal at home, eat together at home as a family, and suddenly when people were going moving into a more urban area and were taking on longer work hours, more convenience foods crept into the culture. And I started to see obesity, uh, chronic disease, and other um, adverse conditions uh, growing, and this was so it was really a moment. It was really a moment where I came into thinking about preventive health care and the importance of nutrition and the huge role that RDs can play in changing the healthcare landscape, not just in the United States, but abroad as well. And so I went back to Teachers College at the age of 30 um, to get my master's in, uh, in nutrition education. And then I went back after working, uh, having my own consulting firm where I consulted uh, businesses, schools, daycare centers and the like, and talked about educa uh, nutrition education. Um, in 2017, I earned my doctorate again from Teachers College. And now I'm a professor, I founded the program at Pace. And I love what I do. I love teaching. I love research. And I don't regret a thing, Angel, because I feel that the background that I garnered between political science, history, and then nutrition education, and uh, working also, I've worked for a, a short time on Capitol Hill, so that was policy. By uniting all, the, all of those experiences, I can really tell my students something unique and offer them unique experiences that I have seen and gone through um, in order to uh, address 
you know, societal issues that they may not otherwise understand um, without solid examples. So I really, um, I really enjoy that. And I think it's so valuable. That is a beautiful thing to hear. And I, you know, it's, it's great to hear you're, you're taking all of your life experiences together and bringing it into the profession because clearly we are a complicated food. Yes, it's food and yes, it's health. But then at the same time, our, our different backgrounds, the, the cultures, you, you've been to Brazil, um, I didn't know that you were exchange student, you know, like you went to do exchange student and then went back. So it's pretty cool to hear all that. And I just love how you've, you've taken it and, and gone forward with it. So that's great to hear. Um, so I guess, is there any other thing? The, the next question would be like, how did you get into academia? And you've kind of explained what you're doing. What was the drive to get you into academia? Because I know some people, I flirted with the idea. I never really wanted to go forward with it because I think I, life gets in the way. We, families, kids, things like that. But what was the thing that drove you into academia? I believe the research component, as well as the teaching, burying those two things that I'm really passionate about and that I really love, I think is what drove me to go from a doctorate into academia. Also, it's sort of uh, just a line that people tend to follow. And so, you know, I, I was offered a job before I graduated and I thought that it was the perfect uh, role for me. But this doesn't confine people to academia. I really want to emphasize, I've had this conversation with many RDs lately, that anyone from any field, and Angel, you and I were just discussing how people from marketing, from uh, you know, computer programming, from all kinds of fields can have a role in nutrition. Um, I have students who have had careers in all of these fields and have come to rest in nutrition because they can blend their experiences. And I really think the future of nutrition as it expands and becomes much more particular is a great place for people to develop particular niches in the field. Um, I think a general knowledge of nutrition is of course incredibly valuable. But I'm seeing pockets of specialties emerging, things like you know, people who are a super specialist in renal nutrition or someone who is really a, a very expert in marketing or labeling of nutrition or generating uh, apps or computer programs that help people to choose foods more wisely. And so I really do think that there is so much opportunity for people who really find a niche and pull together all their experiences in one place to, to design their own career. There's a lot of room for that. Yes, yes, because I, I always laugh. I think, you know, when we when we all get into the field, it's like, well, you got the clinical route or the food service route, and this is it. And then it's like, well, there, yes and no. There's just a lot of different opportunities out there, and it's beautiful to let people talk about it so we can enlighten the next generation of, you know, students and young professionals. So thank you for that answer. So next question. I, I kind of, I asked this question and I feel like sometimes people feel like I wouldn't really change anything, but if you could do it all over again in your career, what would you change and what would you keep the same? You know, I wouldn't change a thing. And I've had my students ask me, gosh, you really took the roundabout route to getting a doctorate and coming to teach. You know, I started teaching at 47. Um, and I don't mind it because I think what gives me the gusto that I have and drives me forward is the richness of experience that I have and what I can impart on my students. And I think that every student, every RD um, should remember is that you are a unique element in our field and no one in the world has the experiences that you have. Your, 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 your you know, signature set of experiences that make you very valuable um, in certain realms of nutrition. And I think we should all you know, take pride in exactly what we bring to the profession and keep looking to the future. I think there are endless opportunities right now. Nutrition is a very, very important uh, area, especially after COVID when we see preventive healthcare providers growing, we see telehealth growing and nutritionists, you know, RDs fit well into that scope. Um, and there's such an interest in what RDs have to say, I think, in the whole scope of healthcare, uh, a bigger focus than ever before. So I think the time is ripe for us to really bound forward as, as a profession. And I really encourage all of our RDs to be, all of our students and people, our, our prospective RDs to, you know, follow your passion. I know it sounds cliche, but follow your passion and take all of your experiences forward. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that answer. So um, next question is, what does the future hold for you? I think the future could hold a few things. I would like to continue teaching for as long as I'm able, but I think that there's, there's room for research and also consulting, right? So taking problems that I'm seeing in the field and helping to resolve them, say in a consulting sphere, um, one thing that I grapple with is my research is on sugar sweetened beverage intake among young children. And in doing this research, more than ever, and I think I knew this cerebrally, and I think all of us do, you know, we think, how can we resolve these society wise problems when they're so uh, multifold? You know, we have all kinds of things we have culture, we have availability, uh, we have price, we have marketing. So, as the world grows more complicated and the nutrition world grows more complicated, I feel that there's more and more need for people to put two and two together and really work with industry, work with our profession um, and, and other uh, you know, professionals in the field to try to resolve these problems together because no one researcher is going to be able to resolve all problems. Um, and so I think being aware of all of the different um, and very complicated factors that lead into uh, individuals' diets is very important. And I encourage, as a community nutrition professor and public health nutrition professor, for all of us to uh, remember that complexity when we're, when we're talking to patients. We're, we're looking at an individual you know, with such, such a unique life and with so many circumstances that we can never know, but we have to get to know them in order to figure out how we can help them solve any problems that they have in their, in their diet. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you said that because I was having a conversation with my boss yesterday and we were talking to, I was saying that exact thing. I'm like, I was like, people are very complicated. It's like, you know, as a kid, what they ate and what their parents exposed them to and, and, you know, the school and just growing up and then they get to college and, you know, people might gain the freshman 15, freshman 20. It's their first time having, a, you know, if, if your parents were very strict, you may not have had an abundance of cereal. Now you go to college, you're like, oh my God, the supermarket is at my disposal. You have money, you eat a bunch of stuff. And then you get older, uh, you know, if you get married, whatever, the background, everything is, people are complicated basically. So I'm glad you said that because I, you know, it's really, you know, you can't just pinpoint one thing and be like, I can only study this because I was like, you line up 10 people, we all got 10 different experiences and that's hard to put in a research paper. So cool. So the final question for you is, do you have any words of wisdom for the next generation of dietitians? And I believe you, you might have said something earlier, but I'll let you, you know, I'll just phrase the question and go ahead and let you answer. Sure. Hi. Uh... You know, when I think about this, you know, I'm, I'm always talking to my students and kind of parsing out advice, which they can take or leave. Um, but what I try to what do I try to tell my students is, you know, don't be afraid to try on a lot of different hats. OK, uh, you know, you may you may love something. You may be good at something. You may feel that you thought you would come into the field doing one thing and leave your internship or your, your program doing another that's okay. Try to make your, 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 your risks and your mistakes as you're learning, right? And this includes the first years of your profession. You know, it takes a while to find your nest, you know, your, your, your home in any profession. And it's okay to not be good at everything. Um, you know, like I said, we're all going to find something where we fall into place. And when you find that, you're going to love it. But that may change with time too. You may discover new areas of nutrition you want to explore. So I guess in summary, keep an open mind, believe in yourself, keep an open mind and remember, and I know a lot of my students have dealt with imposter syndrome and I always say, come on, you're a nutrition expert now, okay? Um, you shouldn't feel like an imposter. Yeah, people, you are going to be the expert in the room uh, more times than not. And, and believe in that. And you're going to learn more and more. And even as a professor, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. But life is a continual learning opportunity. And so feeling good within yourself, not being able to say, I don't know that, I can look it up or I can find out. And giving your, being gentle enough with yourself to learn along the way is really important. Um, it's, it's really important for your, for your own well-being, your mental health, and also for the profession. Absolutely. Well, I... I fully agree. I think uh, sometimes the 
the imposter syndrome might be popping up for people because they, they can look at social media and they can see all the cool things that people do. And then they feel like, you know, they are looking at somebody at their best and they feel, you know, a person feels at their worst. So then they feel like they're an imposter. And unfortunately, that's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, the grass is not green on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. And if you are confident in what you're doing, you're going to you're going to be great. And we all have a room in this field to to grow and enlighten the the you know, any, anybody, because I, I feel like whether you're working with a, a person in food service, trying to get them the meals that they want, or being a dietitian on the floor or, you know, media, uh, you know, with a, you know, I make a quote and it goes all around the world. We all have a part in this. So I greatly appreciate that answer. So with that being said, oh, sorry, continue, go. You know, that's okay. Just one other thing came to mind. Yeah. I Day, and I think, Angela, you can relate to this as a media spokesperson for the Academy. Never be afraid to talk to the media. I really feel strongly that RDs should be the ones talking to the media about nutrition. You know, if someone asks you for a quote in the media, this is not only a good way to get your name out for people to know what you do, but it's contributing to the field. And it's taking it's taking sometimes some false information or, you know, it's kind of secondary information that might not be as accurate as what an RD would give. So, so that's another way to sort of believe in yourself and, adv and advance, um, you know, your career um, is by not being afraid to reach out and talk as an expert. Um, yeah. You know, reporting. Well, no, because there's a lot of, I mean, unfortunately on social media, it's, it's, uh, it's the one common denominator that cuts across everybody. And then, you know, somebody who lost 20 pounds, um, you know, trying the grapefruit diet or, you know, they're going to be like, look, I did this. And so then everyone's going to go to this person who had 20 pound weight loss. And, you know, is that going to work for everybody? What happens if you dislike grapefruit? What happened if you're on statins? I don't know. You know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta kind of go there. So, but yes. all of yes. us do have a voice and if we can put our voice out there and, and be the credible person, um, it just makes the profession look better as we move forward. So, exactly. I would just say in parting, um, when as, as as a professor, when I see my students enter two years, you know, before they graduate, they enter, I see these very capable, fascinating, well-versed, intelligent human beings. But I can't tell you the change that I see from the person who entered the program and the professional who leaves the program. And I think we who educate and precept, RDs need to remember that these students are going to be our colleagues of tomorrow in a very short period of time. And I always love to welcome my students as colleagues. It's, 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 there's nothing like the joy of seeing a student become your colleague and knowing that you, you help thread the needle and help weave the fiber of their education. And so I think we have to remember that as educators and preceptors, how fascinating that is and how important our work is. It is. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I greatly appreciate you and your time. I know you're a busy lady and I just, you know, I love the fact that all of us get to see each other, you know, and I will miss you at Fancy, but uh, hopefully we see you sometime in the future. So thank you very much for being on with me today. And I'm also on the platform, buy me a coffee. This is a platform that allows creators like myself to create content and get rewarded in their, a variety of payments. I've decided to do it via coffee. So if you'd like to buy me a coffee, you can do so. And if you want to send one to the uh, individual I'm interviewing, send it to me and I will send it their way. With that being said, thank you very much for being here with us today. I hope you really enjoyed the video and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.